Hello everybody. Welcome to the presentation for a short paper predicting the health condition of mHealth app users with large differences in the amount of recorded observations. Oof, quite a mouthful. I'm sorry. The paper title at least is not short. Uh, but um, before I continue, I want to thank our external collaborators from Bulgaria, from the Public Health Department, Mirela, Plamen and Dorotea. Um, also, without Rudiger and Johannes, the app which generated the data on which this study is based wouldn't exist. And of course, Win, Winnie and Myra for their continuous support. Um, yes, so as you see from the title, we deal with an mHealth app. And uh, the problem that we have is that the data generated by this app, there are large differences in the amount of data generated by different users. Uh, of this. So uh, to give you a quick technical backdrop of what the app is doing, the it is an M Health app that collects ecologically moment, ecological momentary assessments, which is basically ecological because you are assessing the disease in its natural habitat. So you're not taking the patient out of wherever he is and putting him in a hospital, for example. It's momentary because unlike most questions that a doctor would ask you, which is how did you feel last week? The momentary assessment asks about how you feel at that moment. So not only is it ecological as in how you feel when you go about your everyday life, it's momentary as in it's asking at different times how you feel at that moment. So the ecological momentary assessment is somehow a weapon in the mobile crowd sensing uh, quiver, let's say. So uh, this enables to sense the current state of a disease through the use of mobile apps. So uh, the typical path that a user takes through one of these apps is shown below for the exact case of the app that we use in this study. But uh, most apps behave similarly. So when you install the app and log in for the first time, you have the user registration, at which point you're presented with the user registration questionnaire. So this collects, for example, information about the general state of your disease, some demographics and so on, which is asked from the user only once. The other questionnaires we have are the food, random and end of day questionnaires. So these are basically uh, questionnaires that are asked multiple times. So these are these form the time series, which are the basis of the study. Uh, and we focus particularly on the end of day questionnaire and the thing that we try to predict is the feeling and control that the user has over their disease. The reason this is what we care about is because the study is funded by a European Union project from Horizon 2020 called CRODIS. And this is about uh, helping patients manage chronic diseases better. And uh, the exact app designed by Professor Pris is trying to study the impact of feedback from the doctor, which might be automated or also manually given by the doctor, and how this feedback affects how, how well a patient is able to handle his disease. So um, a quick introduction to the data. The chart you see on the right is the number of days of data contributed by different users in the system. It is sorted, of course, in descending order. So the thing that makes mHealth data different is that uh, quite often, Apart from just the time series, we also have some extra information. So we know something about the patient, like their age, their gender, the, the, the nature of the disease, or the, the strength with which they were suffering when they joined the platform, etc. And we also know from previous experience that the patients develop sometimes in idiosyncratic ways. So they are best predicted given themselves. We have some uh, data issues, which of course we have to complain about as scientists. So um, one of the big problems is that data can come in irregularly. This is um, a, a problem also because many time series algorithms out there assume that your uh, observations are equidistant, for example, hidden Markov models. And of course, uh, since you're asking humans to fill out a questionnaire, maybe they don't feel like answering all the questions all the time. And this gives us a lot of missing values. Now, looking at the chart on the right, you see that there is a big gap around uh, the, around 30 days, for example, where uh, 
there is one user with about 35 days of data and the next shortest user is much shorter which has barely two weeks and this leaves us with a clearly distinguishable group of five short users and six long users which is based on the amount of data they've given from these two groups we will ask the following questions so how well can we predict uh, short users given long users so how will the short users develop given how the long users have developed because you have a lot of data on them and uh, can we predict the entire short user given a model trained on long users alone so basically um, this is more complicated than simply predicting unseen data you're predicting entire unseen patients and the third is of course how can we incrementally fit this into a model to get better predictions because the short users are also giving you your data and you want better at predicting them as um, so the way we do this is by studying two workflows so we uh, have the prediction problem which is to predict tomorrow's end of day feeling and control given today's end of day questionnaire so the end of day questionnaire asks uh, how much did you exercise how uh, healthy do you feel and how much in control of your disease do you uh, feel emotionally um, Given that our data set is not so large, as you saw also from the chart, we are restricted to very simple models. So we have the transfer learning scenario where we train a linear regression on data from the long users and we try to predict this on the short ones. We also have a user k nearest neighbors regressive, which is a user level model, which is every user basically gets his model. And uh, we use this to uh, predict the user's future. So this basically is trying to predict the user's future given the user's past, only that user's past, not other people. And we obviously also ask the question, how can we best combine the predictions from both these models in order to get the best results? Before we begin, we need something of a baseline to know how good can we be in the best case. So uh, we build a very traditional train test split model. So I mean also not so traditional because when you split the data into train and test, we make sure that the first 75% of each user's data ends up in the train and the, the last 25% is in the test set. So you have to be aware of time as well as users when you're sampling the train and test data. And as you see, the mean absolute error is around 17. So not so encouraging, but it, it is a baseline nonetheless. Um, you also have to remember that uh, this baseline model is taking 75% of everything. So it has seen a lot more data than the next few models you're gonna see, which form the, the real workflow. Um, also the error that you see on the right over the short users is also not very trustworthy because they mostly come from just two or three uh, points of uh, evaluation for each user. So uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a very biased measure on the fag end of the user's life, of the short user's life. Okay, so transfer learning from the long users to the short ones. To the question, do long users predict short ones? The answer is on the right <laughs> so uh, the box plot is over all predictions and uh, you see that there is a very large uh, variation in the errors so you can be wrong by as much as almost 50 units and uh, the the mean absolute error is about 10 units higher than what you saw on the previous slide uh, but you see that the mean absolute error is closer to 21 so basically it's, it's biased to the left and the median is higher than it. Uh, and we see that this mean absolute error is biased towards the longer users amongst the short users. So uh, that's maybe something interesting. So uh, the next thing that we have is the k-nearest neighbors regressor. So um, this, if you see that the k-nearest neighbors regressor is somehow predicting better than the other model, which is transferred from the long users, then this gives us some reason to suspect that users are more predictable given their own past, 
which you have to remember is a lot less data. Uh, and so we build basically one model per user and a K nearest neighbor regressor is built on that user's own history. So since we have very few observations already and we need to make as many predictions as possible, K is simply two in our case. So the two most similar sessions in my user in the user's past will be used to predict how that user developed. You see basically that the k-nearest neighbor regressor has even larger errors than uh, before, but both the mean and the median errors are lower. So the mean absolute error is lower and also the median errors overall predictions is lower. This stresses the need to make some kind of good compare, uh, combination. And that's what you see here. So for the for at each point at which we make a prediction, so all the way from the first prediction we make to the last prediction we make, we looked at the average error over all users. And you see that the linear regressor becomes worse and worse over time. And uh, the k nearest neighbor regressor becomes better and better over time. But um, since you saw already that the uh, KNN regressor makes some really large errors sometimes, we basically uh, formed a weighted combination of both these uh, methods. So if uh, a particular method predicts really well for a particular user, then we give it a better uh, give it a better uh, weight, and um, yeah, we, we compute the weighted average based on that. So that concludes our presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention, and look forward for your questions.